Hello and welcome to my home mastering studio and it really does look like a home mastering studio this time rather than the last time I said hello and welcome to my home mastering studio or the second time that I said hello and welcome to update number two or even the third time that I said hello and welcome to the third instalment the only real difference between the room now and the last one of those recordings is a lick of paint and some furniture. Um, but I didn't just put those in to be cute with video editing. I'm sure you could hear the change in the sound in the room between each of those videos. I'm going to talk about that a bit more in a minute. So lots of people have been emailing me asking me to, to do this final video and I thought I'd give you a quick tour of the room and ask some of the most common questions that people have about what I've done here. So this is my space. Uh, I have my back catalogue, or some of it anyway, um, on the shelves, which is great. I have some of my favourite music books. Uh, you can see my trombone um, waiting for me one day to maybe start practising it again. Uh, you can see the bass guitar that I don't play and the acoustic guitar that I really don't play. And I'm really pleased with how it's turned out. It's a really nice environment to work in. And that's important. You know, if we're going to spend time trying to be creative or productive, um, it's it's great to have a space that really works for you in terms of the feel of the room. I, you know, I've got a view here over trees and the village green. It's a great space. It's a, it's a pleasure to come here and start work in the morning. So let's get down to the nitty gritty. People want to know what I'm using. So I'm completely in the box in this room. I'm just using my Mac Pro. Um, I do have a TC Electronic PowerCore 6000. That's the Firewire version of the System 6000, which is I've been using for 10 years and would be my digital processor of choice uh, in a, a full flight mastering studio. So there's lots of other alternatives these days, um, but I still haven't found anything that I prefer to the sound of the processing in the TC. Um, I also have TC for monitoring. I have this Desktop Connect 6. That's not an expensive converter at all. It's a Firewire unit, plugs into the straight into the Mac Pro. Uh, it's got a good sized volume control on it. It's got headphone output. It's got a dim button. It has a mono switch. It even has some line inputs, which I've never used. Um, I've never put it head to head with the best converters in the world, but TC make the System 6000 and that has some of the best converters you can buy on it. That was 10 years ago. So my guess is they've put a lot of what they've learnt into little units like this. There's a more expensive unit that comes with XLR in and out. Um, it's kind of aimed more at the professional market. But for me, the value of this is that I can just stick this in a, a briefcase or a rucksack and take it wherever I need it along with the HD 650s and I will know in anybody's studio exactly what I'm hearing. You know, I've been using this monitoring setup for years um, and there are no other variables there. So I can listen to what I'm getting from the speakers and kind of tie that in with what I'm hearing and really quickly get a great idea of, of what I'm listening to. So that's really valuable. For monitoring, I have my old hi-fi speakers. They're B&W 602s. You can't get them anymore, but the 685 is the modern equivalent. They cost about £500 new. So, you know, they're great speakers. Um, I auditioned a whole range when I bought them. I, I got them as a 30th birthday present. Um, and you have to spend a lot more money, in my experience, to get something that sounds better. This is just my starting position. I'm not saying I'm going to stick with these forever, but they are extremely accurate. They have great frequency range. Um, and... Crucially, I know exactly what they sound like. I've been road testing my mixes and masters on them since I was 30. And that's invaluable because I'm coming into a new space, into a new room. I have recordings and masters in my back catalogue that I can listen to that I know how they should sound. But knowing how they should sound on these speakers as well has been invaluable for me in terms of tuning the room and getting myself up and running. They're quite small, but I think that's fine for a room this size. If the speaker was just too huge, they would overwhelm it. I am interested in upgrading them at a future point, but I wanted to take time to hear how they worked in this room, in this space, and see how good I was going to be able to get the sound in here to know whether it was worth investing in anything else. Uh, and of course, I do need a new pair of hi-fi speakers now. 
One question I get asked quite a lot is, aren't the speakers too low? Most people expect the speakers to be mounted up at head height, um, and they're lower down. The, the tweeters are kind of down around here. The answer is they're fine. There are a few reasons for that. One is that they have a very wide vertical dispersion from the tweeters, so I'm not losing any uh, top end. I'm not outside the sweet spot by sitting up above them. Another one is you can see that they are quite close to the, the window. I have this big window across the front of the studio. If I lift them up, I'm going to get them much closer to the window. I'm more likely to get reflections back from that window, cause comb filtering or other problems with the sound. By having them lower down, the GIK tri-trap acoustic treatment uh, units that I have behind them are absorbing a lot of the sound that goes backwards from the speaker before it bounces off the walls, which is beneficial. And I'm also minimising the possibility of comb filtering from reflections off the desk. The higher up I move them, the more likely that is to be a problem, and you can test yourself for that using the same mirror trick that I explained in the last video for placing the panels on the walls. And the other question people have asked me about the monitors, having watched some of the other videos that I've done, is whether they're too far away. And again, the answer is no. I mean, first of all, this is a small room, and they're quite close to me. They're only about five or six feet away. But also, this is intended as a mastering setup. I've always been more comfortable with the speakers further away, and in fact, I quite often will roll the chair back and listen from the other end of the room to get something that approximates more to what people will do when they listen to this in their living room or bedroom or wherever they're choosing to listen to the music. So this setup gives me a great opportunity to get a balance, to get the best of both worlds, really. Some observant people amongst you have noticed that, yes, I have the speakers temporarily mounted on bricks. I have a solid floor here, so that's okay. I've got my hi-fi speaker stands, I just needed to lift them up a little bit further off the floor to, to clear the desk um, and allow me to hear them clearly. That's working fine for me at the moment. One thing I didn't do was test the room, meaning run test tones and record the outputs and plot graphs and all that stuff. Actually, it's not strictly true. I did download a, a test tone, a chromatic sine wave test tone from Mike Senior's website. I'll put the link uh, on my site near this video if you want to try it yourself. A, a sweep tone can cause you problems because the frequencies build up in the room and you just get a really confusing frequency plot from them. I didn't plot the frequencies myself, but the chromatic tones just goes up in steps of semitones and it will enable you to pick out any problem areas that you might have in your monitoring. So that's something you might want to try. People have asked why I'm not measuring the room. There are two reasons. One is I don't feel I need to. I'm lucky. I have a big library of recordings and masters that I've worked on in the past. I know exactly how they sound, what their problems are, what's good about them, what's bad about them. So when I listen to them in here, I know how they should sound. And that enables me to, to tweak the, the setup of the acoustic treatment and the placement of the speakers in the room. The other reason is just I don't want to scare myself. I don't want to be second guessing myself. I feel confident in my ability to hear those examples accurately and make judgments about new material that I'm listening to. You know, when I'm assessing things, when I'm doing example masters for people, because remember, this is not a proper mastering studio. Um, providing I have that confidence, that's good enough for me. I, I know that I can, what I'm hearing is reliable. If I do a waterfall plot or detailed test analysis of the room and find out all kinds of problems on paper, if they're not translating into problems that I hear in the room, I'm almost not interested in them. I mean, I guess you could say I'm being a bit of an ostrich about it and sticking my head in the sand. I'm not saying you shouldn't measure a room that you're trying to optimise, but I do think it's possible to get obsessed with frequency plots and the theoretical setup of the room um, when, in fact, we could be saying, this sounds great, I know what I'm doing, I'm going to move on and make some music. One interesting thing that did come up from using the sine wave test tones, the chromatic test tones, was I knew, in theory, the best place to sit in the room is about a third away from, of the room length away from the front wall of the studio, or two-thirds back, so basically in thirds, not right halfway in the middle of the room, for example. That would be kind of a worst case. 
So I looked around the room, eyed up where I thought that was, put my chair here, put the desk into fit and carried on setting everything up. And when it got to the final stages of should the speakers be a couple of inches forward or back, I started using the test tones and after quite a bit of messing around, I decided I needed to come back about six inches. Out of interest, having done that, I then me measured the position from my head to the wall, divided that distance by the length of the room, and lo and behold, the ratio was 0 0.6. Not exactly two-thirds, that would be 0 0.66666, 0 0.67, much closer to the golden ratio. That uh, same ratio that I was talking about in the first video when I was talking about finding the ideal dimensions for the room. So by listening and using those tones to try and find the most balanced position for me to sit, I discovered that the theory in this case was correct. That may not be the case in every room. All of these theories are great starting points and then you need to tweak them with listening. But I thought that was interesting that that's how it turned out in this case. And I did find that adjusting the positions of the speakers very slightly. I found this in every room that I've ever set up. Moving them out by a couple of inches, back in by a couple of inches, back by a couple of forward back. It won't make any huge difference to the really low end stuff that's going on in the room. That's pretty much a given. But in terms of the balance of the mid range and the highs, all that kind of stuff, and some of the, the higher up room nodes, it can make a big difference to what you're hearing. So if you set up your room, play back your reference material, have your panels, and initially it's not as good as you'd hoped don't despair. Be patient, take the time, tweak, and hopefully you'll be able to get a great result too. So let's talk about the panels. You saw which ones I chose in the last video and where I was planning to place them. That is, in fact, where I've put them, minor tweaks for the position. And I had hoped to do some actual recordings of music with and without the acoustic treatment so that you could hear for yourselves what a difference it makes. But unfortunately, I've just tried some tests and they're not coming out so well. I don't uh, have time, this video is already quite long, um, to do that justice at this point. So if I'm able to sort that out at some future point for you, then I will. But the differences were very clear. Reduced flutter echo when I snapped my fingers, I didn't hear that and a zing sound. The room nodes all calmed down. I stopped hearing this booming. I remember the first time I played back a recording of my voice in this room without the acoustic treatment. I was horrified. I thought this is going to be impossible. But I mean, you can hear for yourself what a, what a good vocal sound I'm getting it now. And the difference is the treatment. So I'm hearing a tighter, more controlled sound, vastly improved stereo image, better frequency balance and a much more pleasing sound overall. One thing to comment on is the benefit of the extra two panels that you can see at the back. You probably remember from the last video when I described the configuration of panels that I was going for and the recommendations that GIK made. They suggested that these two panels at the back would be beneficial for me. And in fact, they supplied them for me so that I could try them out and report back to you guys. And what I would say is they are definitely worth having. What I noticed when I take them out surprised me, actually. I wondered whether I would just hear better control of the bass when they were in place. But without them, the sound is subtly colder and uh, not as full in here. And I feel like with them in place, the stereo image feels broader and more accurate, which fascinates me. Now, it's a very difficult test to do. Anybody who's read my site will know how... Uh, important I how much importance I place on the doing accurate before and after tests between things so when you've got to get up move the screens out listen bring them back in again you can never be completely uh, objective about it it's fascinating I mean I would say that the setup here that I have with the tri traps the side panels and the roof panels is probably getting me 75 to 80 percent of the way to where I would want to be but actually, I think those panels there are like the icing on the cake. Who knows? I may add more treatment in future. Um, there's definitely a law of diminishing returns. You're going to get huge benefits from the first pieces of treatment that you put in. And the better the room gets, the more subtle the improvements after that will get. But I certainly think the two extra Mondo traps at the back of the room uh, would be a worthwhile investment if that's something that you can do. 
or if you want to build something similar yourself. So I'm really pleased with the results. It's not perfect. There are things that I want to try to improve the sound in the room further. But as a first step, I'm absolutely delighted with the results that I've got and the advice that I got from GIK about these screens and putting them in. And hopefully that will help you try and get a better sound in your room too. Um, you know, we don't need the most expensive gear in the world. The TC monitoring unit I'm using costs £130. The hi-fi speakers are quite expensive, but they're not extraordinarily so. And knowing them really, really well is more important in some ways than having the best possible speakers in the world. Lots of people get caught out. They think, oh, I'm setting up a studio. They go out and they buy some lovely new monitors and find that all of their instincts are off and they take months to acclimatize and maybe never do. So, you know, better to work with what you know really well than to keep spending money on new gear, especially when you're getting set up. And finally, whatever space you're working in, whether it's a custom built studio or a converted garage like this, please take the time to invest in whatever acoustic treatment you can, whether you buy ready-made units or whether you make something yourself. It is probably the single most significant thing that you can do to improve the quality of the results you're getting. Uh, you will not believe what a difference it makes to the quality of your monitoring and the results that you're able to get. There you go. I hope that was interesting and useful. My name is Ian Shepherd. Head over to productionadvice.co.uk for more videos about recording, mixing and mastering. Subscribe to the YouTube channel to make sure you get any future videos that I put out. And yeah, thanks for listening.